Go ahead, Stu, when you're ready. Good evening, and welcome to the Creek Fire presentation uh, and community conversation for Tuesday, September 22nd. We are going to begin this evening with a moment of silence to honor a fallen hero. Thank you. Tonight, we uh, once again have the A team of first responders, public information administrators, public information officers, and town county staff that I would certainly like to thank uh, for attending. Uh, always busy evenings, busy days, um, and certainly for our team behind the screen uh, supporting this meeting. So thank you. Uh, we'll begin this evening with an operational briefing from Evans Quo followed by the uh, questions from the chat room. Uh, we'll get to the questions in the chat room first, and then if time allows, uh, we'll respond to any call-in questions. We are also presenting this evening in Spanish. Um, so if you're listening to me in English and you're a Spanish speaker, please log out and log back in and select the Espanol audio option. And we'll also just pause here for a quick translation from Cassandra. Buenas noches a todos. Soy Cassandra de parte de la extensión Latino Comando Unificado. Esta noche la presentación sobre el incendio llamado Creek Fire se presentará en inglés y en español. Para aquellos que hablan español habrá un icono de función de idioma en la parte inferior de su pantalla, junto al chat y el cuadro de preguntas y respuestas. Para escuchar en inglés o en español oprima el idioma que usted quiera escuchar esta conversación. Eh, la presentación se transmitirá en vivo a través de Facebook debido a, a dificultades técnicas. La transmisión no podrá ser interpretada en español a través de Facebook, solo a través de esta aplicación de Zoom. Esta presentación será grabada y será interpretado en español después. Recuerde, si tiene preguntas, pueden mandarlas por el chat box y si tiene, si está llamando y ocupa hacer una pregunta, oprime estrella y nueve. Gracias. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, public information uh, regarding the Creek Fire is available on the Mono County portal, which is right there in front of you. That's for the Creek Fire incident. Um, we also have a new Espanol section right here. So if you're following along in Spanish, uh, click on that tab. We've also added the NCWeb incident overview link right here as well, which also has uh, Spanish information. Um, and then this is the link right down here on the bottom. You can also follow along on the CAL FIRE, Creek Fire Information page, updated daily. Jennifer and her PIO team do a phenomenal job on that site. And again, update the Creek Fire Information Facebook page, and that is Sierra National Forest Facebook page. Uh, and if your question was not answered this evening, click on that Contact Us button, uh, button on the homepage and email us at creekfire at townofmammothlakes.ca. Gov. With that, I'll hand it over to Evans Quo, Deputy Incident Commander, Great Basin Team 1, uh, for tonight's operational briefing. Evan. Hey, Evans. good evening, everybody, and thank you, Stuart. Um, I'm going to just pause for a second and load a, a Google Earth image of the fire. So what you see on your screen in front of you is um, the, an infrared imagery of our of the Creek Fire, which is mostly the uh, the reds and yellows with a little bit of the, you know, the, the red dots. Um, Every night a, uh, an infrared plane comes overhead and uh, captures an image of our fire and then they transfer that to a map. In addition to what you're also seeing in the, uh, like the greener blue um, polygon, such as this one up on the north end, that is the old Lions fire scar from 2018. Uh, the reason why we're showing that is because it's a significant feature for us and most likely to be able to use as a fire scar. I guess I'll pause there for Cassandra to get caught up. Cassandra, were you going to provide a translation or should I just keep going? I think you're okay to keep going. Um, we have translators behind the scenes that are translating on the uh, Spanish portal, Evan. So okay. you're, uh, you're good to go. All right. My apologies. I, I, you're I very welcome. Doing a great job. 
<laughs> okay. The other, the other feature that I want to show on the Google Earth is in front of the fire, um, up on the Sierra Crest, you can see the large expanse of granite rock. A um, lot, lot of that is fairly devoid of fuels. And if you look at some of the past fire history, um, that is probably what stopped or slowed down the Lions fire in addition to the actions that were taken. Um, so as we look at our fire, there's a few things that I want to point out. Um, last Thursday and Friday, uh, we had that wind event that was mostly coming out of the southwest with some fairly strong winds that had, uh, had the potential to push the Creek Fire north and northeast uh, towards the uh, town of Mammoth Lakes, as well as a lot of the other values such as Mammoth Mountain Ski Resort, the, uh, the Lakes Basin, um, the Devil's Post Pile National Monument um, out in front. So as a result of, of that pot uh, potential or that risk, um, we engaged in a, quite a bit of coordination and pre-planning with the Inyo National Forest, the National Park Service, uh, the town of Mammoth Lakes, uh, Mammoth Lakes uh, Fire Department and Mono County Sheriff's Office to uh, pre-establish pre actions that we would take in the event that the fire started moving that way and start threatening um, the community and those values. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm happy to report that <coughs> during that wind event, um, while the fire did, did move to the north in some places, um, it did not go in any directions that we were concerned about and, in, and it also did not trigger um, any of our management actions that uh, we had in our part of our pre-plan. So even though the winds were um, fairly brisk up on the crest, they weren't as bad on the fire itself. Um, and as a result, the, the fire is as, as pretty much as you see. Um, we've been monitoring the fire very closely every day since then and providing uh, various uh, community members or the, um, the, the, the forest, the, the park service, the, the town uh, and the sheriff's department with re regular updates in the event that the situation changed. Um, and up, to, up until now, uh, everything is pretty much where, where we kind of expected it to burn um, and it, it's starting to show significant signs of slowing down in, in those areas. Two things we're watching very closely for and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, the first one is in the south fork of the San Joaquin River drainage. Um, we were watching to make sure that it did, the fire did not cross over um, in any significant way or in, in places where we were concerned about. And, so as you can see from a lot of the rock expanse in the drainage bottom, um, the fire has pretty much stopped up in there. Um, this, we believe, even though it shows a little bit of fire across, we believe that might've been a mapping error um, because we have been unable to verify it since then with other, other aircraft platforms in the area. Um, but there's, there's a fair amount of rock over on the other side and it's shown a lot of good resistance to uh, prevent fire from spreading across the, San, uh, the South Fork of the San Joaquin River. The reason why we were concerned about that was because in the event that the fire were able to get across the river drainage and get up on top of Pincushion Peak, you can see a lot of that fairly continuous expanse of unburned fuels. Um, and that, and if it were to get into that, we, it would probably most likely burn and burn intensely, um, depending on which way the, the wind was blowing. The other area that we were concerned about was what the fire would do once it got into or across the North Fork of San Joaquin drainage, which is the, the drainage that I'm showing in, this, in the middle of the screen, and get into the, the old uh, the 2018 Lions uh, fire scar. To date, none of uh, all of our um, observations of that is that that fire scar is acting as a um, suitable barrier, similar to a lot of the, the large rock granite expanse up above. Um, so we're feeling pretty comfortable that fire spread in this direction is a low probability or low likelihood of the fire making it through that burn scar, through the rock outcrops and into the town or the, uh, the, the, the ski resort. So backing out a little bit, we also have some of these white lines that you can see on the screen. So the first white set of white lines is on Pig Cushion Peak. Um, so as you remember when I was talking about, it had the fire across the South Fork and got into all those unburned fuels. We, we were expecting to see some very active fire spread, which had not, has not happened yet. But in the event that it does and gets it up to the top of Pincushion Peak or, or where that white line is, that was one of our trigger points. Um, and the actions we would take in that event would be that we would stand up a firefighting organization over on the Mammoth Lake side. Initially, it would probably most likely consist of the uh, local personnel from the, uh, the, the forest as well as the um, Mammoth Lakes Fire Department and augmented with personnel from our side of the mountain um, from, from the Creek Fire. However, you know, it's a little bit of a drive to get over there. So we would rely, be relying on the, the, the local folks initially, but there's a fair amount of distance from the South Fork to the town of Mammoth Lakes. I mean, we're probably talking 12 to 15 miles. Um, so we felt like we had the time um, to build up the, the response um, if, if the fire were to make it to Pincushion Peak, which is why we put the trigger point on Pincushion Peak. 
in the event the fire kept on moving to the north, uh, the next white line that you see in the drainage bottom, that's the, um, the Fish Creek. So if the, if the fire were to make it to Fish Creek, then at that point, um, not only would we have that large, organiza large organization established over at Mammoth Lakeside to protect all the values in the town, but it was also, we would also start coordinating very closely with Sheriff Braun, Sheriff Braun, uh, excuse me, on any evacuations that would be need necessary, either be an advisory, um, kind of like a ready set, ready set type of thing, or mandatory, which meant, yeah, now is the time to leave. Um, but as I said before, um, we're, we're happy that we have not needed to trigger any of those, those needs. Um, and I think a large part of that is, uh, it has to do with a the, the lot of the natural barriers that we have in place, as well as a lot of the fire behavior that we have seen. Um, and it, it really helped a lot as well. Uh, last week, uh, I think it was Friday, where we received a little bit of moisture um, that, calm, that calmed down the fire activity. And then every, every day we, we get closer into, uh, into the next month is the, the days are getting shorter, the nighttime temperatures are, are going down and the ability for the, the fuels to dry out and warm up enough during the daytime is going down. The threat is not eliminated. However, we're feeling, feeling like um, we're, we're starting to get, get to a point where the, 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 that the likelihood of this fire moving to the north is, is less and less each day. So with that, uh, Stuart, I think I'll pause there unless there's questions. Great, thanks Evans. Um, why don't we just leave that uh, presentation up on the screen and um, Lauren, we'll uh, start with the Q and A's on the chat room. Thank you. Do you have a forecast for the level of unhealthy to hazardous smoke levels in the Mammoth area over in the next week, as well as when we might expect some reduction in smoke levels? Yes, so right now the, the forecast into the next week is a, a, a high pressure dome will be, be establishing over the, uh, the Great Basin or the, you know, the Nevada, Utah area. Um, unfortunately, the effects of that high pressure dome is going to cause a lot of, inst or a lot of stable air conditions, which means the, um, there's not going to be a lot of ventilation uh, or ability for the smoke to mix out and leave the valley bottoms. Um, and of course, that, that unfortunately is going to result in having, keeping those air quality levels at very high and unhealthy levels. Um, though there is a little bit of a silver lining in that, that a high pressure dome also has, keeps the wind events down. So um, the, the likelihood of us having another large significant wind event like we did last weekend, which really accelerated the fire and moved it north, um, is less likely to occur. So sorry about that. Good news yeah. and bad news. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Uh, Lauren, next question. How far is the fire from Pincushion Peak map line? So we're, we're approximately about four miles or so distance wise. And it has to get through, um, get through that a lot of that terrain there with a lot of the rock outcrops. And you know, to date, it's withstood quite a bit of wind. We have a weather station on Mount Tom, uh, which is farther, farther, fairly close to that area. Uh, there we go. Mount Tom's kind of right there on the edge of the screen. So we're getting some pretty accurate weather readings uh, from there. And it, that fire has uh, with that fire edge in the San Joaquin drainage has withstood some pretty decent winds. Thank you, Evans. Uh, Lauren. I understand why you first prioritize imminent danger to human life than structures, but at what point will persistent, extremely hazardous air quality in Mammoth get priority? and resources put on reducing fire areas to contributing most to that? That's a good question. And right now we're, we're still under fairly high, high levels of competition for firefighting resources. So, and unfortunately what that means though is, is we're unable to commit resources to the north end of the fire to, to stop, stop that spread and um, you know, secure that edge so it doesn't continue to produce smoke. So right now, our, our majority of our effort is concentrated on keeping the fire out of the communities of, like, say, you know, Shaver Lake, Huntington, Aubrey, Prather, um, Bass Lake, North Fork, on the um, on the Madera and Fresno County side, and you know, and right now we just don't have the resources to go after um, the north end of the fire. What are the proactive actions being taken, i.e. airdrops, fire breaks, getting personnel to assist our minimal resources in Mammoth before it hits the pin push? Right now, as I said before, our, our priority is the other side of the, uh, the, the fire. So there, we're, we're monitoring the situation and most, for the most part, using the large rock expanse and other natural barriers to, to, check, to check the fire. I mean, 
to think about most of our dozer lines they're you know eight to 12 feet wide sometimes a little wider if we build um, build them double wide but you know you look at a lot of this rock that's way better than any dozer line we can ever construct If the fire holds steady on the northeast corner and does not reach the next management action point by September 24th, will the Inyo National Forest consider opening some of the forest for day use? The Tahoe Basin MU has opened to day use and the National Sierra National Forest Supervisor has indicated they will try to open some of the Sierra National Forest when the region order to expire on the 24th. Yeah, this is Poncho. I can answer that. The regional order will expire on Thursday night at midnight on the 24th. So our plan is right now is to reopen. And, and this is contingent. I am working with our regional office because every forest is slightly different now. Um, you know, we closed them all at one point, but each one is different and, and has different publics that they're dealing with. So what our goal is right now is to reopen the uh, most of the national forest except for the wilderness areas and the reason that we're doing that is all the wilderness areas and the wilderness trails and the trailheads all lead into either the either the creek fire the sequoia complex the castle fire or they lead into into uh, national parks that are now closed so for right now what our goal is is to reopen the national forest to the american public except for the wilderness areas. And uh, my goal is to make that happen on Friday morning. And this is Deb and I would clarify, this is Deb Schweizer. Um, the wildernesses that are in the Sierra Nevada, not in the Inyos and the Whites. Correct? Thanks Deb. Yep. That's correct. The Inyos and the Whites would be wide open. We would just open that area. We're still probably, we're still going to restrict um, uh, open campfires will probably allow stoves, but we're we are not going to allow campfires except in established campgrounds. Thank you, Lauren. Could you explain the red dots and yellow areas and the red lines? Yes, I'd be happy to. So um, when we when we use our infrared air aircraft overhead, we 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 um, the infrared detects the heat. And then we have a human analyst that goes through the, all those heat detections and they characterize it into either intense heat, scattered heat, or isolated heat. So the dark red areas um, and orange areas, that's what, they, what we consider intense heat. And then the, um, the, the yellow areas is it's, it's scattered heat. So it's kind of, the, you look for the break point between when it's, it's, it's very, very intense and, and, and it's starting to burn itself out, but it's still holding quite a bit of heat. And then the red dots are isolated heat, um, so just single points. You also see some other different colors on there, such as uh, some of the, um, the, the magenta colors and the purple colors. That is because the, um, not every night our infrared platform is available, so we've have it, had to um, use a combination of um, different types of platforms in order to, to map, this, map this fire accurately. So we, you kind of have a little bit of a hodgepodge of colors out there. Um, but essentially we try to use the um, you know, red, dark red is, is the hottest areas and then um, yellows and oranges as the, the cooler areas. What started burning this afternoon, afternoon around 11 today? Most current map shows it well across the South Fork. <coughs> no ma'am, uh, or no, it, it's as far as we know, and I'm not sure which maps you're looking at, but uh, based on our intelligence, um, the fire is still, on uh, to the south of the South Fork. Uh, you know, there, there are some um, satellite detections um, that it's most, a lot of satellites are fairly coarse scale on their detections. And then they, um, you know, the, the, the resolution of them is anywhere from, you know, 300 meters to, to a kilometer in, in size, which is a, it's a fair, pretty good size pixel. Uh, think of the pixels on your TV. Um, and then the other, other challenge that we sometimes have is when the satellite is not directly overhead and you're looking at it obliquely, um, the, uh, it could throw the image off a little bit, um, kind of like um, uh, when you're looking at fish underwater and the refraction, the, the fish isn't quite exactly where you're, you're looking at. So, so right, currently right now, manned aircraft with um, you know, uh, satellite or uh, infrared camera systems that can get in a lot closer than satellites can are, are a lot more accurate and then that's what we mostly rely on. 
Any chance of aircraft being used on the northeast side? There is, if, if, in, the, in the event that we have a need. So we've been watching very closely some of the, um, well, like for example, some of these spots in, inside the line fire scar had that gotten active um, and got into some of the unburned fuels just uh, uphill of it. Yeah, that probably would have qualified for us to uh, try to suppress that uh, or not at least knock it down and slow it down. But not, not to date, we haven't yet to take that up, any of those actions. We've also been uh, having some difficulty with some very thick inversions. Uh, depending on the elevation and uh, the drainages. Um, and so sometimes we, we are hampered by our ability to fly because um, the smoke is hanging in the low in the inversions and the, the pilots can't see. Does reopening the forest meaning camping and overnight use as well? Would that be for Deb or Poncho? I'm sorry, I, I missed the button there, Stu. Yeah. Uh, yes, it does. We the the force would be open for dispersed camping. Thank you. Is there a correlation between containment and air quality? When would you expect a fifty percent reduction in the air pollution levels? I think there's probably a better correlation with air quality with um, atmospheric stability and um, winds that can clear out the smoke in the area. Containment has to do with how much smoke we're, we're continuing to pump into the atmosphere. Um, so yes, as, as we start to contain the fire, hopefully, you know, our hope is we will, we will limit the amount of free burning that the fire does. But um, I think we have probably have better odds with um, to improve the air quality with, uh, you know, uh, if, if and when the, um, the high pressure dome or high pressure system over us breaks down and, and allows for increased stability or yeah, increased instability which will allow the, uh, the air quality, the smoke in the atmosphere to mix out. Thank you. Lauren. Do you have a new estimate to when the Creek fire will be actually out or close to out? Earlier it was stated mid-October. A lot of that depends on weather. Um, there's a lot of places on this fire which are starting to burn into areas that are difficult for firefighters to access. Um, so, I think, um, you know, mid-October, depending on what the, the weather the, the weather this fall does, um, is, is a possibility. Though I think uh, if we look at historical records um, over the last 20 years, we'll probably have a lot better odds of seeing a, um, a weather-ending event closer to around uh, Halloween. It feels pretty helpless sitting back and watching the forest burn. Is there anything we can do as average citizens to help? You know, that's a great question. Um, since we've been on this, this incident, our team and all the firefighters, we, we received an overwhelming um, amount of support from the public. Um, for a lot of us that are away from home right now, and we've been home, away from home most of the summer, um, that, means a, that means a ton to us. Um, so we thank you for your support. Um, as far as what you can do, you know, the other night, last week when we had the same call, there were some questions about what people could do to help. And, you know, the thought occurred to me afterwards was, you know, help some of your neighbors, you know, help those that can't, can't do, physically do it themselves. And, um, you know, just that, that, that in itself would probably be, be immeasurable on, on the on assistance. Thanks, Evans. Lauren. Yeah, this is Poncho. I'd like to add on to that is, is just, let's just have some grace with each other. It is a, uh, 2020 is almost a curse word with the pandemic and fires and smoke and everything that we have going on is, is just, let's just have grace with each other, with our firefighters and, and with the, the people around you and your neighbors. Good call. Yeah. Thank you, Poncho. Lauren. Please clarify, are campgrounds and dispersed camping camping opening in Mammoth Lakes area? Yes, they will. <clears throat> I don't believe that all of the developed campgrounds are going to open because some of them are closing for the winter season but there will be some developed campgrounds open and, and dispersed camping will be allowed. Dispersed camping in camping out on the forest with no campfires 
Um, I'm trying to get it where we can allow campfires in the developed campgrounds. For how long can we expect heavy smoke in Mammoth? I think we kind of covered that Evans, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say for at least the next week, as long as the uh, the high pressure is sitting over the top of the Great Basin. Got it. Next question, Lauren. Uh, the area around Mont Mount Tom could jump into the pincushion area. If so, what is the plan of attack? So we are monitoring that fairly closely. Um, and uh, in, in the event that it does, um, there's limited actions that we're able to take just because the access is, is not, the great, uh, not the greatest. We could use aircraft to try to slow and, ch and check the fire spread. But to be honest, um, as heavy as the fuels are and as dry as they are in there, it may not have a lot of effect. And then um, aircraft is, is most effective when we can follow it up with uh, ground forces, firefighters on the ground. So. Given our other higher priorities, lack of access, the difficulty to getting up in there, um, there may not be a whole lot we can do, which is why we've got the contingency plans identified as if it moves forward north, farther to the Northeast. It appears as if there is a spot fire in the lion's burn scar. Is that correct? And if so, is that an area of concern? Yes, it is. Um, it, the, our um, infrared aircraft detected that the other day. Um, in fact, two nights ago, it detected quite a few more spots in, inside the old Lions, uh, um, Lions fire scar, uh, probably burning in some fuels that survived the, uh, the, the previous fire. Um, today's infrared shows significantly less number of spots inside the scar, so we believe that they're burning themselves out, not able to spread. Got it. Thanks, Evans. Lauren. Allowing campfires, even in established fire pits, seems wrong. What pressure are you receiving to allow campfires and how can the Mammoth community help push back on allowing fires? I think I'll send that over to Poncho. Okay, I'm not sure and I, I think I understood your question, but um, we're allowing campfires in developed campgrounds. Our history here on the Inyo National Forest is that we have had very, very few, if any, fires start from campfires in developed campgrounds. The reason is, is those campgrounds are well maintained. The area around the fire pits are, are cleaned out and, and, uh, and, and kept debris free. So we don't have the, the concerns about having campfires in the developed campgrounds. I don't wanna have campfires in the dispersed areas at this point because the weather's still hot enough that, that one of those fires could get away. So in the developed campgrounds, it's, it's not really an issue, but I do not want to have them out uh, in the dispersed camp areas. Thanks, Poncho. Uh, Lauren, we'll do a couple of more questions and then we might do um, some call-in questions. Looks like we have some people, some raised hands. Okay. If resources were not a concern, is there any action you would take now? In other words, is some of this being allowed to progress because it's natural to have fire in this area? So I, I'll talk about it from a, a risk management standpoint and then um, maybe turn it over to the forest for a little carry on with that. But um, from a risk management standpoint, risk is for the most part defined as a probability and consequence. So for the, the, the fact that we have a fire in the area, what we've been doing all along is assessing what is the probability or the likelihood of that fire continuing to burn in, and burn into places where we do not want it to burn. In other words, the consequence. Um, right now, what we're seeing signs is, is the natural barriers, such as in the, the large expanse of rock in the Sierra Crest or in the, the South Fork drainage, are keeping the fire at bay or they're resisting fire spread. As a result of that, um, low likelihood or lower probability, that also drops the risk down. So as long as the risk is, is at an acceptable level, we feel that it's not worth the risk of exposing firefighters to additional hazardous conditions um, in, in those locations. Thank you. We'll go to a live call. Um, phone number ending in 6833. Go ahead and unmute yourself.
doesn't matter. We can hear you. We're, we're on unmute anyway. It doesn't matter. No mute is what we want. We can hear you if you just uh, ask your question. Okay, going on to our next caller. Um, our next caller is George. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Where would we go to get information on air quality for mammoths? What what agency would have a website with updates daily? So I can answer that one. That's the um, Great Basin Unified Control Pollution District. And you can also um, look up airnow.gov. Uh, both of those uh, are accessible on the Mono County Creek Fire portal. Um, which is accessible um, from the Mona County website um, or you can type in, you know, in your Google bar uh, Creek Fire Mona County uh, and that'll jump up and you'll be able to kind of get those updates as they come in. I think they're updated. Uh, the Great Basin one is updated hourly and I think the Air Now one is pretty frequent as well. Stu, so this is Deb too and I there would go, say that um, Thanks, there's also a a ARA and Air Resource Advisor smoke report that's coming out daily with the Creek Fire. So if you're getting those by email or if you go to NCWeb or to Facebook, they have their localized Air Resource Advisor smoke report that's localized for Mammoth and Levining and some others. So you should be able to get it that way too. Great. Thanks, Deb. Lauren, uh, next question. Next caller. Next Sorry. caller is <laughs> Tara. Go ahead and Unmute yourself. Hi, just a question. Um, so once it, if it was to get to the Pincushion Peak line, um, would that be just an evacuation warning or would that be a complete evacuation? Um, is there any, what's the plan for that? I think that's um, Sheriff Braun's cue. That's my cue. So Pincushion is not an evacuation management action point. That is a resource action point where they would bring in more resources to our side and stage them and have them prepared should the fire push any further east. The management action point where we would issue an evacuation warning is Fish Creek, which is further out. So if we got to Fish Creek, then we would issue an evacuation warning, which means get yourself ready to go, pack up your belongings, have a plan. You should always have a plan. We live in the forest. If we get to Fish Creek and I send out an evacuation warning and that would come out via Code Red, if you're signed up for Code Red, it'd also come what we call IPOS, which is the emergency alert system, which makes your phone light up and yell at you, get out, get out, get out. I'm not saying get out, but that would be the management action point for us is Fish Creek. Now beyond that, to go from a, a warning to an order, that would depend on the fire. We don't have a set line for that. That would depend on how fast things are moving, how slow things are moving, what we're what we're really concerned about and if we really think that people need to get out of town. But Fish Creek is your warning point. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Lauren, next uh, call in. We do not have any more call in questions at this Good. time. Okay. Who is in charge of enforcing fires outside of establishment? fires and um, are there campground hosts? Yeah, this is Poncho. <clears throat> the U.S. Forest Service um, are, are responsible for enforcing the, the fires outside of the campgrounds. Um, but actually we do that in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department, the Bureau of Land Management, and other agencies. Um, but, but the Forest Service are the ones that it is our regulation. Thanks, Poncho. Next question, Lauren. How will the MLFD protect the structures in the Lakes Basin if the fire gets there? Mm, Chief Revolt. That's a great question, thank you. So uh, 
prior to and a little bit during the, uh, the recent wind event, uh, I did bring on some extra crews, even though we weren't uh, near that MMP2 that Sheriff Braun just talked about. Uh, and it hadn't crossed uh, the South Fork that Evans has laid out with that uh, world-class imagery he's been giving us. Um, we did start to dust off some pre-plans that we'd had for the Lakes Basin. Um, we'd also started inserting some um, uh, picture graphics, uh, you know, assigned to GPS locations for structures. We have about 150 some odd structures in the Lakes Basin. So that um, if we did cross uh, those evacuation points and warning lines, and we had to bring in um, personnel and equipment from outside the area that are unfamiliar with it. Um, on those maps, uh, they have a detailed road network. They would know where the propane tanks are, diesel, hydrants, drafting sources, et cetera. Um, and then it, it overlays in our mapping, some mapping tools that we use um, and allows us to stay situationally aware where uh, each other are so that if a, a certain area gets a little more of a uh, of a push to it, we can shift resources there and that we can also evacuate our resources if we started to get uh, overrun or in some type of trouble. Um, also, we're plugged into, as Evans laid out, uh, part of that NAP2 is to put together an initial attack organization that will put Poncho and his staff on that. Uh, and we would be responsible for the structure protection group in that, uh, but we'd also be working closely with uh, ground resources and potentially air resources. So it's a coordinated response. Great. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Lauren, next question. Are there enough Forest Service employees to patrol dispersed areas? A group of locals went out before the forest closed to help remind campers that fires were not allowed. Uh, I can answer that and Poncho can tag on to that. No, there aren't. Uh, but we are out of camping season and I don't anticipate a whole bunch of people wanting to camp out in this smoke as it is. I, none of us want to be outside, so I can't imagine that other people want to sit outside and sleep outside and breathe that day and night. That said, uh, we do have patrols, the Sheriff's Office patrols, the Police Department patrols, the Fire Agencies patrol. We respond to calls. If you see a campfire going out in a dispersed area, please call and let us know and we will go and have them put it out. It, it's important that we know about that and that we remind people of their responsibility to be safe in the forest. I think Frank's got something to say. Yes, as an unintentional quality assurance step, uh, the other day when we had some clear air, I went out for a walk and I, 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 you know, I turned up a normal route I take and uh, within about five minutes, I ran across one of those hard to find patrol people and they were very kind to remind me mm -hmm. the forest was closed. And I said, great job. I actually knew that and completely forgot about it. So while they are um, few and far between, they're doing a great job out there. They gave a really clear explanation, had a wonderful handout for uh, those that are a little less, uh, a little more senile than others like myself. And so uh, they are out there. They're covering some ground in places where people would be at. And so I know that's helping mitigate the, mitigate the threat. Great. Thanks, Chief. Um, I just want to jump in really quick. I know there was some uh, confusions with the Zoom uh, login today. Um, our apologies. Um, we have hopefully corrected that um, on the um, public service announcement list, uh, Tani news list and media list. We've kind of pushed out those new links. It's also live on Facebook and we'll also um, be posting the recording uh, on the Creek Fire Portal page, and you can also access it on our Town of Mammoth Lakes Facebook site. So again, uh, our apologies for any confusion. Uh, Lauren, next question, please. I have spoken to restaurants that we work with. Many staff were not aware of the exit plan from Mammoth, if need be. Can you touch on that? Sheriff Brown? <clears throat> or Chief? Yeah, there is an exit plan. We, we will put that out if it becomes uh, closer to the point that we need to actually do that. But between uh, Mammoth PD, Mammoth Fire, Mammoth Sheriff's Department, CHP, uh, we've developed a, a pretty comprehensive plan and the information will be put out uh, if it even gets close to that point. So people uh, know we are, <clears throat> excuse me, also working on people who do not have transportation, working with ESTA and possibly the, the Mountain Views, their buses, if we need to help uh, assist people get out of town and, and down to Bishop. And if I, if I could add to that, um, to underscore what uh, uh, Chief Davis said and, and what Sheriff Braun had mentioned earlier, keep your phones charged up. 
um, because while we think we may know the direction we think seems to you know to occur and, and happen from um, the organization we've set up allows us to do essentially what we call calling an audible um, which means we may need to redirect traffic from what we plan to have so um, just please stay tuned keep those phones charged and uh, we would give you the more specific details at the time in the unlikely event that we had to evacuate well and additionally um the intersections and things are all going to be staffed there's going to be barricades so it's it's not necessarily that you need to know the direction you need to go you just need to follow the path that um, you're being directed to and, and not necessarily uh, uh, have to know and, and memorize a plan beforehand thank you chief davis sorry uh, apologies for not uh, directing that question to you um but uh, we'll get you at the chat room in front of your <laughs> Brady Bunch kind of section there. Uh, Lauren, next question, please. Can you review what to do to let first responders know that you have evacuated to save time for first responders to respond to other people? So the general rule is even if, you know, we had some uh, code or signal, um, the fact is uh, when people are in a hurry, uh, visibility can be poor. We're going to, we're going to check uh, regardless. So the biggest thing is, as, Sheriff Braun and Chief Davis said, have a plan, um, be ready, and uh, make sure again, your phone is charged and uh, get, get hooked into Code Red. Um, but we are gonna check those areas regardless. Things happen, um, so we'll, we'll, that's part of the job. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Lauren, next question, thank you. What changes on Thursday that makes it safe for the National Forest to open? Will new resources become available that could respond to a new forest fire? No, there won't be any new resources available to, to respond to a forest fire. We're gonna utilize our, our current, our current uh, resources that we have in place. Really what's changed is, is for the Inyo National Forest is the days are getting shorter it is getting a little bit cooler. Our burning periods are shorter, and and we feel that that we can um, allow people back into the national forest. And we manage the land for the American people, so I don't want to keep them off the land if I can help it at all. So what I'm trying to do again, as as Evan says, is is it's a risk analysis. I'm trying to mitigate that risk. I feel at this point that the risk is low enough that I can allow people, I can allow certain things to happen. Campfires in established campgrounds, but not out in dispersed campsites. But I can't allow people out in dispersed campsites with stoves because that risk is not very high of them actually starting a fire. Um, so that's, that's the reason why I'm trying to get the American people back on their land. Will the non-wilderness area of Red's Meadow open on this Friday? No, it will not. And the reason is, is that Red's Meadow and Devil's Post Pile has been prepped for the event, or the, 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 if, if the fire were to get to that point, that area has been prepped. Devil's Post Pile buildings have been wrapped. We've got sprinklers, we've got hose lays in there. We have all kinds of equipment and stuff in there and we don't want to pull that equipment out and let people back in there till we're absolutely sure that there's no danger to to anybody that's down in there that would be down in there and and so we're going to keep that equipment down in there until we're positive that we're not in any danger from the fire then we'll pull it out and allow people back in there thank you poncho uh laura next question What is the risk to the Rock Creek area? I, if you're talking about the risk from the fire coming over the Sierra Crest into the Rock Creek area, um, I think it's probably pretty low. There's a lot of granite up there. There's a lot of space in between the fire where the fire is at right now and the backside of the Rock Creek area. So um, that's one of the reasons that that area will be, will be uh, reopened on Friday is to allow people up into there. Thank you, Poncha. Lauren? Will cell phones work if the power goes out? 
I can take that one. Um, uh, we have had some uh, healthy and spirited discussions with our, our uh, carriers in the uh, Greater Mammoth Lakes area over the last few years. And there's also been state legislation um, requiring uh, auxiliary power for cellular sites. So um, I'm way more concerned about people running their cell phones down to zero, going to bed at night and plugging them in with the anticipation that the power stays on. Um, you know, keep those things charged up during the day. Um, we have uh, solid generator backup in this immediate area and actually throughout Moda County um, for the various carriers. And so uh, that, that should stay on. But the biggest concern is, you know, it's kind of like keeping your gas tank half full. Um, go ahead and make sure you don't let your cell phone get down about half because uh, that's where we're going to reach out to you when you least expect it, if we need it, which is really unlikely. Thank you, Chief. And if Nate Greenberg was here, I'm sure he'd give a, a great uh, supporting detailed answer as well. So, <laughs> but yes, we've done a lot of work uh, initiating the, with the PSPS work and we believe there's some good resiliency with the um, network providers. So, uh, Laura, next question, please. The numbers on the Air Now site seem low compared to actual smoke and poor visibility. Do the sensors need to be cleaned? I, I don't think any of us can answer that question because we don't have the, the expertise on that. I would say no, that's what they're intended for is to gather that data. So I'm sure that they're built to gather the data accurately. They're not always up current, they're about hourly. So they, they might be a little bit behind. I would say if that person wanted to email um, the Creek Fire email address, creekfire at townofmammothlakes.ca.gov, uh, I can work on getting an answer for them. So that's what I would recommend there. And then Gordon, you wanted to jump in too. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the uh, sensors actually measure, um, or the number that you're seeing uh, measures a specific uh, um, pollutant, in this case, uh, PM10. Um, the visual indications don't always follow that particular pollutant. So sometimes you'll get a visual uh, blocking of uh, your view where the pollutant that it's, that it's measuring, the PM10, uh, isn't that high. That, that's another reason for it. Uh, there is a delay as well. Good job. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, Laura, next question. Why is the northeast part of the fire still low priority as it has been called? So much talk about evacuating and burning of the priceless country around us. So right now, the, our, our main priority is, is life and safety of the, the public and, and, all, and then after that infrastructure and property and the vast majority of all of that is being threatened by the, the Creek Fire is, is right now on the, other, on the Madera County and, um, and Fresno County side of the mountain. At the Sierra National Forest live brief tonight, they said the fire was 4.2 miles from Mammoth. Is that correct? No, it is not. That has been corrected. Stu, can I uh, add on to the previous question? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Chief. And we've had a range of, of questions generally asking about, you know, prioritization on that part of the fire that is closest to Mammoth. and smoke suppression and, you know, can we get equipment in there, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the teams that are managing this incident, they're world-class at what they do. Um, that's true whether I say it or not. Um, they, they spend decades getting into the positions that they have. And I support um, their priority there. It may, it may seem a little frustrating to us, but, you know, we send people out to other incidents um, throughout the state, Mammoth Fire does. And, you know, I rely on their judgment to make these good risk benefit calls. And uh, we've got great visibility for the most part um, on what's going on there. And we can't see directly, there's good IR, IR information. Um, every day that that fire kind of smolders and burns those fuels out uh, and stays on the other side of the, the drainage there, that's an insurance policy for the future, just like we're, we're benefiting from the Lions fire. So um, there's, there's way more risk to hurting some young men and women, putting them down in a really you know, high risk, low benefit area. And we'll have plenty of time uh, to respond if something gets across there and we can take some more action. But I, 
you know, I really support uh, what's happening there and, and we rely on that same judgment for our own people. Thank you, Chief. Lauren, how are we doing? We're at uh, 7.50. We've got uh, about 50 questions in the queue. We'll see if we can kind of summarize some. Uh, and I know there's some statements in the uh, chat box um, that people want to have the questions go in order. What we're trying to do is kind of summarize a lot of the questions just because we're just going to run out of time. So that's kind of how we want to try and address as many questions as we can if they're very similar. We'll try and get them to the panelists for their response. So again, um, you know, we do have 10 minutes. We'll certainly go over um, and try and get all these questions answered. But again, we're just trying to um, put them together so they're very similar. So um, Laura, next question, please. Thank you. Also, if there's a question you want answered, you can vote up it and that goes up in priority. Have there been discussions about letting the fire continue to burn north to consume as many of the d dead bark beetle trees as possible, like was done in the Lion Fire before taking a strong stance to prevent further spread? So not deliberately. Are we, are we allowing, are we letting that fire burn to the north? Um, you know, we really want to try to stop it as, as, as quickly as we can, um, as, as safely as we can, but right now we're trying to use every tool in the toolbox, so to speak, um, and a lot of the, uh, the natural barriers up on the north side of fire are really helping, helping with that to buy us the time. Can Evan show on the map where Fish Creek is and also Mount Tom? It appears that Mount Tom is surrounded by fire. Is this the same Mount Tom which dominates the landscape of Bishop and Owens Valley? So I'm, I'm thinking there's probably multiple Mount Toms. Um, the Mount Tom that we're, we're dealing with is the one inside the fire. I'm going to try to share my screen again. Bear with me. And I will just say it's not the same Mount Tom. This is Deb Schweizer. The Mount Tom we look at at Bishop is not the same Mount Tom. So if this helps, I'll try to zoom out. So, so there's Mount Tom. The label's going to go away. As I zoom out, there's Mammoth Mountain and there's Mammoth Lakes where the, um, the little pin is. So we're quite a ways away. Thanks, Evans. Uh, Lauren, next question, please. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to go through all these. There's a lot of uh, questions on enforcement for no campfires, um, a lot of concern about campfires. Um, Can you review the importance of defensible space around your personal property? That would be yes. the chief. Yeah. Chief Freeball, thank you for asking the question. It's always a good opportunity to, to stump that message a little. Um, yes, you know, for some quick references, you can go to our website, uh, Mammoth Lakes Fire Protection District. Um, and we have a section in there called defensible space uh, and there are, there are a bunch of tools there. Generally speaking, you just work from the side of your house out, uh, pull any combustible materials away from the base of the, uh, uh, the home, especially if you have, um, you know, wood that doesn't make it all the way or where it comes all the way down to where you may have leaves or litter, um, other debris. Um, you can contact our fire district for um, evaluation of your home. Uh, we do try, we do go out and do defensible space inspections. I have a small staff, lots of houses, and so it can take us a few years to make the rounds. Um, so if you have specific questions, you can uh, call us there at Fire Station 1 and we can have someone come out and give you direct advice if you don't see what you need um, there on the, uh, on the website. I'm going to post that uh, for everybody to access right now, guys. So, uh, Lauren, next question. In case of evacuation, is it preferable to leave your home locked or unlocked? I've read both online. Also, should window coverings be left open or closed? I have also read that some lights should be left on. Thank you. Uh, the lights are helpful in the in the evening, uh, especially if it's out in places that are uh, you know farther off of the roadway. Uh, but again, as I said, we do have uh, maps that we'll use to try to be thorough 
uh, and, and checking for those structures. And it will also help out uh, our law enforcement partners as they're doing evacuation uh, and can find and see those. The, you know, the questions on uh, you know, curtains down, curtains open, you know, I've actually seen both where, you know, the radiant heat could be enough to where it, it uh, melts vinyl, uh, you know, coverings inside of a, of a structure. And then depending on the type that's there, if they're a heavy cotton um, linen type of material, they don't catch enough, catch enough heat. In terms of locking or unlocking your, your uh, building, I'm more concerned that you get out in a hurry. Uh, law enforcement staff will be there to uh, evacuate and they will also uh, patrol those areas. You've seen that uh, regularly throughout other fires and we do the, uh, the same thing. So uh, the primary thing is to make sure that, that uh, you get out. If we feel like we need to get in and make access, we certainly know how to do that. That was gonna be my point, Frank. I would lock your house, lock your apartment, lock your condo. If we need to get in for whatever reason, we'll find a way in. Uh, we can kick down doors, whatever we need to do, but, uh, and you'll know that we did it. So it's better to lock it and make sure that it's secure because odds are it will still be standing when you get back and you want everything to still be there. Good advice. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Lauren. When and where can I access a replay of this presentation? So I will post again the uh, email, uh, website address of the uh, Mona County Creek Fire portal. So it'll be posted on that page. And again, it's also um, Facebook Live. So you can jump on the Town of Mammoth Lakes Facebook page and access that video as well. And once again, we apologize for any confusion with the link today. Um, but again, I'll go ahead and post that uh, website address in the portal. Thank you. Do you want to take another question or do you want to wrap up? Um, if everybody's okay, let's um, see how we do. Let's maybe give it uh, 10 minutes. Lauren, if you've got uh, kind of enough variety of questions for the panelists to get through, if we haven't answered some of the questions, let's, uh, let's do those. I know there's um, plenty coming in. We've still got just under 60 to go, but some are very um, similar, but also some are just commenting on um, the appreciation for the panelists and the information. So um, let's uh, let's see how we do for five or ten minutes. Thank you. Is this Lauren, if I could. Uh, Thank you, Sheriff. Could, so uh, there was a question in there about the Mammoth Bike Park reopening or any of those facilities. Um, no, they're, they're texting with somebody from the mountain. And even if the forest does reopen, the bike park is closed for the season as all summer off. So the Sierra Star Golf Course will stay open till the 11th of October. What is all the blow up on the backside of Peck and Pop? Blew up a lot about an hour ago. Also, is the fire still heading towards Brown, Browns Creek, Seven Rock, RD274? Oh, I, so think the, that's, the, I think that's you, Evans. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> so the west flank of the fire in the vicinity of uh, Peck and Pop Meadows, Central Camp, um, all the way down to, um, like say, Cascadel Woods. Um, that's an area that we've been prepping for oh, quite a few days now to um, burn you know, using a variety of road systems, dozer lines, and we also have contingency lines in there. We initiated firing operations um, yesterday, and our plan is to continue burning um, all those indirect lines until we uh, we tie off that that west flank of the fire to protect the community of North Fork and Bass Lake in that area, as well as Central Camp and Peck and Paw. So, so that you're probably seeing our um, our firing operation. What impact will be will there be on the town's drinking water if the fire consumes the watershed around the Lake Mary and the water infrastructure? Any uh, any takers on that one? If if we don't think we can answer that one, um, we'll just have the person email the Creek Fire at tanamamathlakes.ca.gov and we'll get them the answer. But Chief, you want to give that a go first? Well, that'd be the first choice is yes, you know, the question there. Uh, generally, when we see, um, uh, you know, fire around watershed, the first thing is just, um, you know, you start getting some turbidity in the water and, and uh, those types of things. So you may, uh, in the, you know, the worst situations, you'll hear maybe some kind of a, you know, 
water boil order. It can be a request to slow down on water use um, to let the, the treatment areas keep up. Uh, but yeah, I would uh, forward that question directly to the people that uh, run the water treatment plant. Yeah, we can uh, request that uh, answer from Mammoth Community Water District if that person wants to email creekfire at townofmammothlakes.ca.gov. Uh, Lauren, next question. Thank you. Can you explain the importance of the five Ps? People, pets, papers, prescriptions. I lost the last one. And photos. So in that order, uh, people first. Take care of your people first and then your pets. For those of us who don't have children, there are our children. So papers that can't be replaced, you need to get those. Your passport, your birth certificate, your marriage certificate, things like that. Uh, fourth is photos, so especially old photos that you haven't scanned in or that have sentimental value for you. I mean, a lot of us have them up in the cloud and whatever. We've got thousands of photos on our phone, but we have some really old photos that are really um, important. And what was the fifth piece? Frank? Oh. Isn't it prescriptions? Prescriptions, duh. Thanks, Deb. Uh, yeah, so you totally need those. That should probably come right around papers. Uh, so grab those. Obviously, they can be replaced, but probably not right away, especially if it's a spendy prescription. You want to grab that because you don't want to have to pay for that again. So people, pets, prescriptions, papers, photos. Thank you. Is the risk similar to the June Lake Loop area and is that area also covered under the Mammoth Evacuation Plan? You want to jump there, Chief, on that one? I'll handle the, the fire risk part of it and I'll uh, let the sheriff handle the, the evacuation part. Um, the more recent, uh, was, it, was the question about the more recent fire at June Lake or, or the risk to June Lake from this fire? The question is the risk to June Lake from this fire. Oh, uh, no, it's as uh, Evan showed in his uh, graphic. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, lots of distance, lots of granite. And as for evacuations of June, would, not that we anticipate doing that for this fire, but should there be another fire or another circumstance where we need to evacuate June? It would depend on the season. Uh, right now, 158 is open all the way around, so we could send people either direction on 158, depending. And then if it's winter time, then it's going to be one direction out. Uh, that's the nature of what June Lake is. So we would have to make accommodations and work with Caltrans and CHP and our other and June Lake Fire and all of our partners call in mutual aid to make sure everybody gets out there and have a, a line of traffic which way people can get out. Uh, Lauren, how are we doing? Got a few more questions? Yes. What about hunters camping in the back country and hunting? Will they, will you keep a no fire policy with them? Yes, we will. That's a good answer. I like the short answers. Thank you, Poncho. When will the next mammoth specific creek fire? Did we lose Lauren? Sorry. Oh, when will the Sorry. next mammoth specific creek fire meeting be held? So this one, uh, we would look at scheduling again on Tuesday and make sure our links are correct from Zoom, uh, if there's any issues there. Um, and then we'll coordinate with the creek fire incident management team and the public information officer there, Jennifer, to see if there's a need to host an additional Facebook Live event uh, before that time. And then again, all that information will be posted on the Mono County Creek Fire portal that I've posted on the chat there. And then we'll also distribute that information throughout the Eastern Sierra through our PIO public information channel. So good question. Maybe that, that should have been my last question at the end, but that's okay. We'll take Sorry. it now. <laughs> will the lakes basin open when the forests open? That's for Poncho again. Or Gordon? Yes, it, yes, it will. And that's uh, the 25th, right, Poncho? 
That's correct. Correct. Okay, we have one more calling question. Rosie, go ahead and unmute yourself. I think I asked this question, it got answered, but here I am. Um, regarding the sensors again, I know with my air filters and things like that, um, the, the vents where the air comes in gets, can be blocked and give you uh, readings that are low because they haven't been cleared. Uh, there's so much blowing out where the sensors are, dirt, smoke, bushes, and so, um, I was glad to hear that uh, the answer that that might be pursued further. Great, thank you, Rosie. Uh, Lauren, next question. I think there was a question on um, for Poncho. What established campgrounds around Mammoth will open? Would that include Mammoth RV Park and Camp High Sierra? Uh, quite honestly, I'm not sure right now. I'm down on a on a different fire, and and my staff is working on that opening. Um, but we will we will come out with a, a message to the public about what campgrounds will be open. Great. And, uh, and this Debel, is Deb, Debel said that. I, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I I will send that out. But I would also say if it's a resort or a marina or somebody who's operating under a special use permit, like those two that were just referenced, were they are going to be able to open, yes. Great. Thank you, Deb. But again, more information to follow uh, next couple of days. So, uh, Lauren, how are we doing? I finalize Just... it, I'll let you know. There you go. Thank you, Deb. A few more questions, Lauren, how are we doing? Uh, yeah, are apps like Code Red available to second homeowners who live out of town or do you have to be in the area to be notified? I can answer that one. They're available to whomever. So you sign up based upon the location and you get the notification by whatever method you choose that I'd say select all of them. Landline, I still have a landline. Cell phone, text message, email, sign up for all of them. Um, and I even recommend for people that have parents that they're concerned about or family members to sign up for their address as well. And then you can get notified. That way you can keep on top of things like that if there's someone else that you're looking out for. And then um, do you want to just describe, Sheriff Braun, how um, IPAWS works? I mean, because you technically don't have to register um, for that service. So IPAWS is the Integrated Public Alert Warning System, which is too much to remember, but it's the emergency alert system. So it's your cell phone, which does show up in the virtual background there. Uh, it should be enabled on everybody's phone. If it's go to your settings, search emergency alerts, then make sure that that's turned on. And that is location-based. So we send out through iPods an emergency alert and your phone will start making a terrible noise and you'll look at it and say, what the heck's going on? And it'll tell you there's an evacuation warning or there's evacuation alert or something to that effect. So you don't need to sign up for that. Everybody gets it. And that's really helpful for a community like ours that has a lot of visitors and tourists that aren't going to be signed up for Code Red and aren't going to know what's going on. And it's also great for where we have reach in the back country so that people who are back there, a lot of our backcountry areas have cell service, so that was helpful for them as well. Great, thank you, Sheriff. So we'll take um, questions, Lauren, till 8.15, how about that? Let's, uh, anybody out there listening along, you have a question, again, if you want it moved up the hierarchy of questions, if everybody likes that question, we'll get to it at the top, but uh, let's work through what we have in the next um, six minutes, thank you. What is the likelihood of a burn scar like the lion's burn scar not successfully holding the We think it's low. Right now we've been monitoring any fire activity inside it just to test our theories and, and so far it's been pan panning out that the, uh, the, the fire scar is, is holding. Um, we have some more questions. How are those with medical issues being taken care of, i.e. life support during an evacuation? So with our- So um, I don't know that we, yeah. Go ahead, Frank. 
Uh, so two part, we have um, uh, through Mono County uh, Social Services, there are um, ways that people can uh, get themselves on a list for special needs. Um, and there's a whole range of those. Some of them, like you say, are life support. It could be oxygen, could be different things. Um, so that's, that's one way they can be supported. Um, also, uh, when we set up uh, any kind of a, an evacuation plan like this, we have a temporary evacuation uh, point. In this case, it was the uh, Bishop Fairgrounds. Um, and in those areas, uh, we can have items staged um, if you know, we, we don't get them rerouted to a hospital or facility there um, nearby. So those are, those are kind of the two immediate routes. How far is the fire from Mammoth right now? I think that's Evan's cue again. I'm oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's still at least 10, 12 miles away, if, if not a little bit more. I'd have to go measure on a map. And it depends, Evan's, where you're taking the measurement from. It's either that kind of northern point or the northeastern finger, right? There's, Correct. I think the north point is closer to Devils, but the other one, um, you know, is northeast, perhaps further away from Mammoth Lake. So. That's correct. From the northeast corner, the one I measured the other day from the northeast corner to the center of Mammoth Lakes is 15 miles. Thank you, Poncho. There you go. Okay, Laura, next question. We've got a few minutes to go. Thank you. How close to the fire, how close is the fire to all the down trees from the wind event that occur, occurred? Has I think we'll spin that over to Poncho. And I still, we're, we're at about, uh, when I measured the other day, based on the, the information I could find, we're about six or seven miles from there. And, and that is a concern. We pushed that information to the team um, last week so that they had that information in case the fire got to that point. Good question though, thanks. <laughs> Can you and if I could, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if Chief, Chief. Falk could, because he's, he's educated me over the years on the different types of uh, fuels that are there, fuels, if that's a fire term, stuff that burns, um, stuff on the ground versus stuff in the air and the different types of fires that we have, there, there's different concerns. So. Uh, all that plays into their decisions. So, Frank, if you can elaborate a little bit on that without being too crazy. As Poncho said, that uh, I believe he said that's about six or seven miles from there. Um, and essentially, if those are, you know, there's a den. If they do get started, they're just harder to put out and they'll, they'll burn for a long time um, as they move through there. But uh, we're, we're still a ways away from those. What is the current thought on the risk of the fire spreading to Mono Hot Springs? So thank, thanks for that question. Um, so my understanding is that Mono Hot Springs is off to the east or in the direction of um, Lake Thomas Edison. So there, there, is, there is some concern with that. Um, we have been seeing some active fire over there um, on the south of Mount Tom, and there is some continuous fuels um, in that area. So uh, to respond to that, um, the team that is managing that side of the fire, um, the CAL FIRE team, uh, we, they have been establishing some trigger points for uh, at Tennessee Point, um, which is probably a couple miles from where the fire currently is in the event that the fire continues to spread to the east, um, in which case then they'll start taking action on um, a lot of the, the, the infrastructure in the vicinity of uh, Mono, Mono Hot Springs. And with that last questions from Evans, we will uh, wrap up this evening. I wanna thank uh, each and every panelist for joining us. I wanna thank everybody for uh, participating, asking questions, being engaged, getting on the phone. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and I do wanna thank Evans uh, for spending his time with us this evening. I know he's kind of cycling out of the fire, if that's right, Evans. And I uh, just wanna thank you for um, your professional knowledge, expertise, um, and spending your time here with the Mammoth Lakes community. Um, so thank you. Again, um, we will provide some updates. We will provide updates, not some updates. We'll provide frequent updates um, on the Mono County Creek Fire Portal. As you can see, um, this evening we'll have that presentation. It's in the chat room. 
Um, you'll be able to watch it live. It's also Facebook Live as well. And then this evening, we also uh, broadcast in Spanish as well for our community. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening and be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, Evan.